Um, so this looks like a properly nerdy crowd, so that's really good. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to do a much deeper dive into the improvements to um, indicator expressions. Um, really, to be honest with you guys, we've been making a lot of improvements with this, and I think that basically no one is using it. I get we get we get virtually no feedback, nor do we get any bugs reported, and that's usually the first feedback that we get is if there are bug reports, then someone's actually using it. And then we're like, oh, great, what are you actually doing with it? You know, and then you kind of get into it. But, you know, DHIS2 um, has been, I would just, let's be honest with each other, all friends here, woefully inadequate when it comes to indicator calculations for a long time. Um, and we're still not there. We have a long way to go. Um, but I think that we're starting to tick off some of the major boxes. You know, I come from a public health background and coming in and working and moving to the University of Oslo and working, you know, a lot of folks here were, were not public health people. They're they're kind of techies, right? You know, they're like informatic software folks. Um, and appreciating the types of indicators that are critically important for public health or clinical surveillance or these kind of things was, you know, not always not always in their kind of purview and their in what they were thinking. So, so um so, but that started to change. You know, we have more public health folks. We have clinical, we have um, uh, clinical advisors. We have people who are medical doctors who work with us full time. We have a new, we have great collaborations with WHO and CDC um, and all these partners. And so they're feeding us requirements. And I think that's the point I want to make now is feed us requirements, right? We can continue to innovate and evolve with this. Um, this is actually an area where we can move more rapidly. Like if you want me to significantly change data visualizer application, that's going to take some time. It's not impossible, but it takes some time. Indicator expressions is something that we have been able to move much, much more quickly with, um, mainly because of Jim. And um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go over the progress that we have made. We're actually going to go back to 236 and just go through essentially everything. Um, and and then we're going to uh, so make sure that you kind of get the whole breadth and view of the improvements that have been made. Try to layer in some practical examples for you uh, to keep it contextual. And then we want to hear from you. And then we, we want to hear what feedback you have to us, what you want. If you think that some of this is garbage, please tell us. Um, and now that being said, today is a little bit of an overview presentation. There's always there's time for Q and A. Um, but tomorrow afternoon, after we have an experts lounge where Jim and I will be sitting there and you can just come up and talk to us and we can go into something more detail. We could talk something more specific about your implementation or use case, any kinds of more detailed questions you have. We'll have time for that tomorrow afternoon after after the session. So um, what I'm going to do now is just give a little bit of a, kind of a contextual overview of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Jim to get into some of the details. And then, unfortunately, I have to go out to a tracker session. So I'm going to have to leave and just hand it over to Jim. But he's uh, you're in you're in very, very good hands. The best hands, better than mine, because he actually made the stuff. So. What's happening? Is this working? Yeah. Are we moving? We're not moving. Should we switch on? Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Green light means go. No, it doesn't. Nope, you're right. It worked 10 minutes ago. If technology worked all the time, most of us wouldn't have jobs, right? <laughs> so is it working now? No, it's not even working here. Weapons. Oh, it's not even working there. It's completely dead to us. This is like the mouse isn't even working. Oh, well that worked. The click works. Oh, it didn't have the focus. Now it has the focus, that'll probably work too. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's let's talk about one really big change. So in DHIS 2.37, we introduced a new functionality called period offset. Has anyone used period offset? That's surprisingly more. You've tried. Did it work? No. We should fix that. Uh, <laughs> things don't always work. 
What good for? Oh, okay. We, we have a not worked and it worked. So that's fifty percent work. That's good. Um. Okay. So period. It, it's, it's been fixed. There were some bugs that have been fixed. So please try it again and let me know. Yeah. So Pete, you'll you'll check that now, huh? No, I'm kidding. All right, so let's talk about period offset. Why did we make period offset? The main use case for period offset that we've that we've been chasing for a long time is the ability to calculate coverage indicators. Who all knows about the annualized feature of indicators? A couple, couple more hands. Okay, so essentially, in previous versions of DHIS two, we had a we had a button, right? The button said, if you're making an indicator, it said annualized. What did that button do? Essentially, if you're making an indicator that's coverage, right? So you have something like B BCG doses given, and then that's over a target or a population. The, the BCG doses given is coming, that data is coming in monthly, usually in, in many countries. It could be coming in more frequently than that even. The denominator here, which is live births or annual target, this is typically annual data, right? So this is just one data point once per year, right? And if you click that annualize button, all it did was it times the numerator by 12. So any month that you looked, it just put, you know, that month's value times 12 over the denominator, live births or annual target, right? I mean, but what we're representing there with that number is an annualized value, not just a multiplication, not it shouldn't, you know, not just a times 12. Like the, what is communicating to the user is this represents a average over 12 months, essentially, or a running, a running value over 12 months. But we didn't actually do that. We just times the numerator by 12. Right? So not great. I mean, that was that was the workaround several years ago. Well, essentially what we're doing is we're assuming that all the months are from the, are the similar values, right? Every month you expect the same number of BCG doses given. And then that would be the assumption to make that value slightly more accurate. But that's not a safe assumption. Many countries have lots of seasonality. You know, you even see seasonality in birth rates, seasonality in vaccination campaigns, you know, there's a lot of seasonality. So if you're just assuming that every month has the same values, or if, in, in fact, all the months do have the same values, then maybe this is an appropriate way. But virtually, that's very, very rare, or at least not common enough to just times the numerator by 12 as the default option, right? So what do we do? So period offset essentially allows you to add up all of, um, uh, you know, as many previous periods as you want. So you can say, I want this month and I want the previous 11 months in my numerator. Same data element, just different moving back across uh, uh, through time. Um, and put that again over the live births or annualized targets. So that, that doesn't change. The numerator stays, uh, changes to factor in all the previous months. Numerator or denominator uh, stays the same, essentially in this example. So what this does is it actually uses the real values that were reported, not just timesing the numerator uh, for this month times 12. You know, it, it, does it really make a difference? Well, in our test databases, it makes a slight difference, to be honest. I mean, our test databases are heavily normalized, though. We don't have the crazy kind of fluctuations that you see in actual country implementations. Um, but but I'm, I'm really curious if, if someone could just put this into their, their clone or their test instance of the country database and see what the actual difference is between a period offset coverage indicator versus an annualized coverage indicator. When I say annualized, I mean you tick the annualized button, right? Does this make sense? Any questions? Is it confusing? Yeah, of course, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> In this example, that's correct. But I mean, of course, like if you have a financial year, that's a separate kind of period than like this like monthly. 
So there, you know, and I think a lot of people have kind of figured out practical workarounds to the annualized problem. Um, but this kind of just, we try to get to the, to the core. Yeah, John, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Yep. That's a really good question. So the 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 official DHIS2 answer is the people the the databases that you have access to could give you permission to do this. You can give someone permission in DHIS2 just to be able to edit one indicator and not do anything else. But that's a complexity of system administrator administration that very few implementations seemingly get to. So it's not like you have to share everything in the metadata app and you're like, you can burn down the whole house, right? Potentially. You could, you know, your, the system admins that you're working with could give you the permission to just change this one thing. But that requires them to do probably 15 more clicks than what they usually want to do. Yeah. Exactly. So another another thing you can always do is is play with these on the uh, on the demo. Yeah. On the demo system, you have all privileges, and it's not yeah. the real world data, right? Then you'd need to talk to somebody in your instance to get the indicator to run on on your instance. But you could at least play with the functionality and learn more about it. I, I got to repeat the questions for you. So there was a question over here. Yes. Could this be easily integrated into pivot tables? I'm repeating the question for the. <laughs> uh, that's a very, very good question. Coming in the future of DHIS2, uh, and we're scoping out the requirements now, we will have a expression builder in some of the data visualizer applica in the data visualization applications. Because we know, like as John was pointing out, that you don't have as much, many people don't have as much permission in DHS2 as they need. And so they want to do what we call on the fly indicators. So I just have my pivot table. I want to add a, a row or a column. And I want to do just like you do in Excel, push enter, and then plug in my own expression. So that's something that we're exploring. Of course, it's very complex functionality uh, uh, and a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, so we've got to we've got to nail down those specific user stories where that should be enabled. Um, you know, we also have to build a graphical expression builder that and that is better than Excel. And Excel has ten thousand developers, and they can't do it well. So we've got to figure out some way to do it. Um, Patrick, do you have a question? Question is how to do coverage for this year. Are you asking like for year year to date so far within the year? That's that's something we're actually working on also for uh, the next version, two point three nine. Yeah, year to date. Um, because like the I think the the maybe the reason you're coming to this is like because everybody maybe you're used to looking in the data visualizer and building a cumulative bar chart, right, or something like that, where that's essentially year to date. That's you make a cumulative bar chart and then you say last 12 months and then you see that value. That essentially is um, a new indicator expression that we're working on. Okay, so that was one example. I'm gonna jump to another example now. The other one that we've been doing, and this is really small, I'm sorry, you can't really see this, but but Jim is gonna go over it in more detail. Um, the other thing that has we've made a lot of progress on is the ability to put in relatively complex um, logic statements in the indicator expression. So like things like if statements, uh, uh, is null, is not null, um, that kind of stuff, right? So for the average user, this is probably gonna be a little bit too advanced because they don't know if statements and you know these kind of things, even for a lot of system administrators, but for hopefully um, some, you know, epidemiologists, program leaders, uh, maybe some more uh, uh, you know, technical people, they would be able to put this kind of stuff in. One of the really 
seemingly important um, metrics for immunization campaigns. And please, if anyone works on a lot of immunization campaigns, tell me I'm wrong. Uh, but at least WHO has made it seem uh, very clear to us that they need to be able to look at ratios. They need to have a metric, a kind of a composite indicator, if you will, that is a ratio between other variables, essentially, other indicators. And the, and the, the performance of those various indicators results in the assignment of a you know, good score, bad score, kind of simple thing. You know, like you're doing bad, this area is doing good, like a scorecard, kind of what you see there, red, bad, green, good. And so what we've been working on is this example here, which is the ratio between, or the relationship between DPT one to three dropout and DPT uh, coverage. So these are two different indicators, DP dropout and coverage. And what we have are these assigned four categories. So we have category one, two, three, and four. And you see that in category one, for example, coverage is greater than or equal to 90%. Dropout is less than or equal to 10%. And you, know, you can see the others. Essentially, we want one indicator that assigns a value one to four to each org unit based upon this, these criteria, okay? So what we, we can achieve this with nested if statements. So we can just go, if, if this, then one, if not, then this, if not, then this, if not, then this. And it just, uh, so, you know, assign a one, assign a two, assign a three, assign a four. Um, and, you know, you get something like this, where you have ones, twos, threes, and fours. And then you can make a legend for it, and then you can put it on your dashboard pivot table, make a simple scorecard. Um, but this is just an example of you can do, I mean, from a from a computer programming perspective, very simple things, but from like a DHIS2 implement, impl implementation perspective, relatively complex things. So like these nested if statements. Um, and the coverage and this, the, you know, the coverage indicators and this indicators were kind of the two things that started to drive a lot of expansions. So this is just two examples of two different functionalities. But as Jim is going to start to go through, there's a lot more here. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of background context of these are kind of the things that we're looking at. So if you have weird indicators, I'm gonna say weird, but like indicators that you're not currently able to calculate, please tell us about them. And we want to work with you to try to figure out how we can do it. We may not be able to, you know, like what you're seeing. Uh oh, come on, Pete. You may not be able to, um, you know, this requires a lot of typing. You know, it requires someone to actually go in and know what the, how to do an expression. And I'm so sorry, it's so small, but Jim's gonna make it bigger for us. Um, you know, there's not, we, we have some simple commands and controls down here, but it's really not that much, right? You kind of just have to know that this works or you just have to be willing to experiment with it. Um, once you do put it in, then we have this translator down here that kind of tells you, hey, it's actually, we recognize that. Yeah. The if statement has actually been there since uh, 34. And I will go over that along with all the other expressions on each slide that will shape which version that particular function has been in since. So hopefully you'll get that question answered for this and everything else. So 34 is quite old, so Rodolfo, you have no excuse. <laughs> That's why we're trying to tell the world about it, because no one is. <laughs> it's in the release notes, but you know people don't read. So um, yeah. Anyways, so, so I just want to give you two practical examples. These are, again, like these are coming to us. These are requirements coming to us from WHO and others. Um, and just to, again, reiterate, if you have things like this, please tell us. Again, we can move more quickly, um, and we don't. We want to minimize the the necessity to do things, you know, in special scripts and that kind of stuff. And I know a lot of folks here probably make their business doing special scripts, but I mean, you don't necessarily have to tell the client. You can just put it here, and then I'm kidding. That's a joke. Don't. That doesn't sound good. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Jim, and but. We'll both be sitting there tomorrow afternoon. So if you have additional questions, you can come up and see us then. And unfortunately, I've got to go tell people how to not keep tracker from breaking. <laughs>
Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm sorry that Scott is leaving. I again, I'm often down in the weeds, and I'll talk about uh, the expression syntax for for lots of these things. And I may or may not be able to answer questions about application. But if uh, if you get lost in the technical thing and you want to ask, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Please ask. And if I can't answer it, I will. So when we say expressions, what does that mean? Expressions are um, formulas that you can use in any of these objects in DHS2, indicators, validation rules, predictors, program indicators, and program rules. And I'll focus in this talk mostly on the first three. Uh, they, the, the expressions for program indicators and program rules often have a kind of different syntax. And we'll start with the if statement. It's been there since 2.34, um, but uh, a lot of people don't know it, and that's why we're starting with it. It's a, obviously a very powerful tool. Uh, one example is you can test to see if some number is positive. You can return one if it's positive, or else zero, and then you can then you can count these over organization units. This is uh, the expression that Scott just showed us for putting things in in four categories. It's saying if in an indicator expression with the n uh, keyword, you can actually invoke another indicator inside the indicator. So this first indicator already computes something complicated. It may uh, compare different data elements, whatever. So you're saying if this is there and that is there, then the answer is one. And simply by nesting these if statements, you end up with a lot of parentheses at the end. You have to close them all. Uh, it's a little bit awkward, but it works, and it lets you uh, calculate something fairly complex. Any questions about that? Yes, Pete. Yeah, not all of these have made it unfortunately into the into the front end expression builder. Again, you gotta you gotta read the manual or attend this talk and learn that. Uh, the question was um, about the indicators. It's not there in the in the visual expression builder in the user interface, so it's it's kind of a hidden feature of expressions. Um, but again, uh, sorry about that. Maybe someday we'll get the the front end to keep up keep pace with the back end but meanwhile you know make sure you scour the release notes and the and the documentation each time um the period offset function this was in the oh yes another question The question is what's possible and with textual analytics. Um, in the last couple of releases, we've done some work on um, in validation rules and predictors and being able to compare uh, textual uh, data values. Not yet in, in indicators because it's it's really assuming that everything is, is numeric that you're working on, but you could have a validation rule uh, now since 2.36 uh, or a predictor that compares a uh, a data element value with a quoted text string, and that should work. And we don't have we don't have uh, we could go nuts with the syntax, right? We could make substring or if the left or if the right, uh, but we don't want to just go nuts because we could. We want to know what the use cases are. So if you have more use cases, uh, please. Talk talk with uh, with us about that on the community site, or put in a a a, a Jira ticket saying, uh, "This is my use case." It's very important. Also, uh, please, when you make a a request for a new feature, say what the use case is. Say why you need it. That helps us prioritize things internally. We say, "Oh, this is this is a compelling use case. We better prioritize that feature." Don't just say, "We want the expression to do this when this when this happens." Tell us why. Build, build your case. That's very important and very helpful for us. 
Um, period offset. This is in the first uh, example that Scott gave. Uh, a very simple thing is you can say you can compare the current value with uh, last month's or last week's, whatever period you've chosen for, for the data. Um, you can use period offset if you're doing stock levels. Last month's starting value uh, plus whatever you restocked minus whatever you lost minus whatever you used and compute this month's starting stock level. Um, and you can also do it again in the example that Scott showed, you can get a rolling annual count by, by taking this month's value plus last month's value and so on up to up to 11 months in the past. And that's the actual formula that that showed the, the slide that Scott showed. Yes. Uh, this is uh, period offset is just in indicators. So if you look at the slide, and I, thank you, I should, I should highlight that. Upon each slide, I'll say what, what kind of expression it can be used in and since when. So the period offset has been there since 2.35. Um, predictors has a different way of getting past period data. You can do that also. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a sense more uh, constricted, but, but in some ways also more flexible. And um, we, can, we can talk about that a bit later, or if it's not covered, please come ask me. Uh, aggregation type. This is for indicators and just uh, released in 2.38. El Marie is smiling. She's been asking for this function for years. Uh, happy that we finally got it in. Uh, up until now, if you have an indicator, if you sorry, if you have a data element and you're using it in an indicator, um, then the data element aggregation type is sum, then that's all you get. You can't say, tell me count the values or tell me average the values. All you get is sum. So the aggregation type allows you to say, I want a count of of the of the values, or I want the average of the values. Any questions about that? Yes. Hmm. For program indicators, uh, the question is: you can be able, you you have been able to count, ask the count by using a, a D two function uh, for quite some time in program indicators, but um, not some other things like uh, first, or min, first or last. Um, again, the program indicators and program rules uh, have all these D two functions. And if you have a use case, again, please tell us the use case. Uh, you're right, that currently can't be done with program indicators. Um, yeah. Oh, that's right. Ah, so the question is, you, you have a place in the user interface to specify an aggregation type, but it doesn't work. Uh, there is uh, custom aggregation. I'm I'm a little bit out of my league because I'm not as as familiar, but you can specify a, a a data element, a program data element with custom aggregation, which means you'll you'll put the formula into the actual program indicator formula. And when we initially uh, rolled out program indicators with the new expression technology. That didn't work. That's since been fixed and patched. So you might come. Please come talk to me after. We can figure out what version you're 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 using and 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 whether there's a, a an answer there. Pete. All right. Well, ping me. Get, send send me send me a message with that Jira ticket, and and I'll see if I can help get attention on it. Uh, the the comment was that it still may not be working, the, the custom aggregation types for program indicators. Um, min date and max date. This is uh, new in 2.38 for indicators. And this is uh, something that uh, Scott covered in the, in the opening session. Uh, if you have rules that change 
over the years. Uh, I know that that PEPFAR has a case where uh, the way they collected data in one year, they had certain data from a data element that was vital to be counted. And in another year, that same data repeated some other data. And so it shouldn't be counted when you're, when you're doing the sum across years. And Scott tells me that in some facilities, in some installations, they actually have different indicators depending on the year. If you want the 2018 data, you have to run the 2018 indicator because the formula changed in 2019, it's a little different. So this allows you to say, um, take this formula, take this data up until the end of 2018 and take this data from the start of 2019 or take this data for uh, 2021 only. But you can have a, a minimum date and a maximum date. You can combine them to have both or you can just say a, a minimum or just a maximum if you want. Any questions about that? Yes, yes. Yes. That's right. The, the, the observation was this works already. If you have data that you're collecting from one year in a data element and you're collecting another year in a different data element and you add them both, well, you'll only find that data in this year and you only find the other data in the next year and it will work uh, seamlessly. It will work perfectly. What this is useful for is if you collect data in both years in the same data element, but you change the rules, so you should count it from that, that data element in this year, but from the same data element in the next year, you should not count it. And this, this lets you do that. Good, good question. Jason. Yeah, you, 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 yes, you can say one, but not the other. This example shows both, but they're, they're independent. You can chain them together or you can just use one. Um, except that the if statement doesn't, doesn't give, really give you access to the date uh, of the data. It, it, it could be if there were some placeholder for the date, which there isn't yet. The date is not a variable that you can use in, in expressions yet, but you can specify the date in these functions. Yes, yes. Hmm. The question is, if you have two different data elements that are collecting the same kind of data and you want to compare them Sure. Yeah, the question is if you have, you want the de denominator to be showing, saying maybe expected pregnancies or actual pregnancies. And I think I'm going to agree with the answer that came up from here. Those are two different, two different indicators. You want to switch from one to the other, yeah. Any any suggestions? How do you switch from one to the other? Okay, thank you. Uh, Sub-expression, 
uh, made it in at the last second, and uh, we decided rather than roll it out in 2.38, we'd wait until 2.38.1. Uh, Subexpression starts to get at some of the limitations of, of indicators where you've had to use predictors in the past, and I will talk later in the talk about indicators and predictors and when you might use one, when you might use the other. A subexpression basically lets you uh, lets you make a, an expression that will happen down in the database before the data gets aggregated. Usually, if you use an if statement in an indicator expression, if you say if this value is greater than one or greater than a hundred or whatever you want to do, it goes and fetches the data from the database and aggregates it over all the organization units in your district or country or whatever. And then in the indicator expression, you're just looking at that value already aggregated. A sub expression lets you look at each raw data value. So for each organization unit down in, in that you're reporting on. So you can do a test. For example, if uh, the number of malaria cases is greater than 100, put one for that organization unit, for that facility, else zero. And then when you look at this in an indicator, you can sum the ones and zeros and actually get the count of the number of organization units having more than 100 malaria cases, whatever is in the test. Yes. Very good question. Uh, I'll repeat it for the Zoom audience. Can rather than having one uh, data item, can you have multiple data items so you can get a, a ratio and say, is it more than thirty percent or or something like that? We know that that is a big use case, and right now the only way to do that is to use predictors, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, this is very limited, and that's a perfect question for the rest of setup for the rest of the slide. The limitation of subexpression, at least at the moment, is that you can only have one data element. Now you can repeat that data element multiple times in the subexpression. So you can say if it's greater than or equal to 51 and that same data element is less than 100. And this can be a data element or it can be a, a what we call a data element operand, the data element dot category option combo. But it has to repeat exactly the same. If you use it with a category option combo, once in the expression, it must be used also in the same expression the same way. So we realized that this is a very limited number of cases that we could accommodate by introducing sub-expression in 2.38. And actually, I had the idea for doing this in the first place. And I went to Scott and said, is this even worth doing? Because I know that people want to do it for <laughs> multiple data elements. And Scott said, yes, there's enough, case, there's enough use cases out there that this provides some use and it's worth doing for 2.38. Um, we would like to go beyond there. The difficulty, the technical difficulty in the database is that each data element is on a different row of the SQL database. And so when you're doing uh, analytics, it's hard to say, you know, take one row and compare it to a different row uh, because we, we, one of the goals is we want to keep indicators very performant. We don't want to slow them way down by doing, you know, sub queries and extra table joins and stuff. So that is something we know it's a it's a pressing need. Um, you can you can do it using predictors for now. Yes, other questions. Sure. Hmm.
Yeah, the question is uh, building on the use case that Scott showed on the first slide, where you have different facilities in category one, two, three, or four, then an obvious thing you want to do is for a, for a district, a region, a country, whatever, you want to see how many facilities were in category one, how many in category two, three, and four, yes. And the answer at the moment is you must use predictors for that. Um, but we, we understand that that would be a, a great thing if we could make that just work in indicators. And, and we keep, we keep uh, wrapping our heads against that and, and trying to figure out, and maybe we will. Um, uh, an exp a new function that was introduced. We're going to move a little way, a little away from indicators for the moment, and this is a function that was introduced in 2.37 for predictors and validation rules. Um, we had some people coming to us and say, "We want to, we want to, we need predictors. We want to to make a prediction, but we want them only for one country. This is for an NGO that's working in several different countries." And we just want to, we just want to run the predictor sets for Senegal, or we want to to run them also for Sierra Leone, but with with different parameters. And so this is a simple um, org unit dot ancestor test, and you can give one or more uh, UIDs of organizations, and you can test to see um, what part of the organization unit tree is is the predictor or the validation rule. Is being run for, and you can adjust the the formula based on that. Any questions? Similarly, for organization unit groups, if you have it set up so that you want the validation rule or the predictor to behave differently if it's a public facility versus a private facility or whatever other kind of organization unit groups you have, again, you can put in the UID of the org unit group, and this could be both this and the, the previous one, you can you can have more than one UID in here, UID one comma UID two and so on. True, true, good point. Would this be useful for, for indicators? Please tell us why. Please tell us why in a JIRA ticket. I, 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 I would love doing all kinds of, of of wonderful things because I'm an engineer and I geek out on this stuff and I'd, I'd like to put in a zillion string comparison functions and but um, Lars and others have cautioned me that we try to do what the users need not what the engineers think it would be <laughs> would be fun. Right, right, there are plenty there. In general, we've been playing catch up with the with the indicators and predictors and validation rules. There are some. Uh, it's kind of been a parallel de uh, development. There have been some D two functions that you can use in in program rules and and program indicators. Some of them are more sophisticated. Um, in some cases, some of these new functions may be may be more sophisticated than those. So yes, it's. it's uh, then in 2.38, a couple of other um, tests that we thought would be useful, again, for predictors and validation rules, you can see if the organization uh, unit has been assigned to a data set or if it has been assigned to a program. And you can change the way an expression calculation works based on that information as well. So that's kind of like a... a, a a series of, of four functions, the, the org unit ancestor, org unit group, uh, org unit data set, and org unit program. Ah, this should be org unit program. Ignore what it is when it says data set. I finished the slide deck yesterday. Sorry about that. Yes. Yes. This th this can be any any logic you want, yeah. Mm. The question is about in in the data visualizer, and I I think what I'm hearing is is maybe similar to what El Marie said about the last slide. Would it be useful to have this in indicator formulas as well? 
Yeah, it's not. It's only predictors and validation rules. But great ideas. I mean, it, this was requested for, for predictors in particular, but I'm hearing that this and the previous functions, uh, many others would be useful for, for indicators as well. Please, please write JIRA tickets. Mm -hmm. They're using number of actual reports versus what? Aha, uh -huh. actual reports for a specific data set. Sure, sure. So again, um, you could do it now with predictors if you use predictor to, to make other uh, data values. But but please, please write us JIRA. I only get to implement what's in a JIRA ticket. So please, please write me a JIRA ticket. Yes, question here. That's that's one reason why I'm staying in Oslo for for four days after this. Uh, so we can one of the things we want to talk about. So interestingly enough, predictors started um, when we were doing disease surveillance, and that's why the name predict and predictor. The idea is if you have a certain number of malaria cases in the past, what do you predict should be the average or what should be a cutoff? above which you might want to investigate a possible outbreak. And the, and the standard formula we were given at the time is, well, you want something that's the mean plus twice the standard deviation or the mean plus 1.5 times the standard deviation, whatever, whatever multiplier. You could put that in a, in a function and look at all the malaria cases for the last 12 months because it's seasonally varying. You want, you don't, you want to go back a year and two years and three years at the same time. And take all that data from the last three years and predict them for the current year. And uh, as, I was, as I was writing the predictor uh, engine, I noticed that for, for past period data, you always had to have an aggregation function. You always wanted to say, this is the malaria count uh, averaged plus twice the, standard, twice the malaria count standard deviation. So you always have to have an aggregation function around the past period data to say, what do you want to do with it? And I was just writing this and I thought, well, what if they don't put an aggregation function? I could either say it's invalid or I could just plug in the current period value. And so that's what I did just to, to make it useful. And it turns out lots of people have been now using predictors just to take the current period value and and count the organization units, count the ratio of these two data elements for an organization unit and, and use that in predictor and so on. Um, so the predictors operate from, in, in aggregate data, they opposite, operate from the data value table and they, they have much more flexibility in doing things at the granular level. Um, we do want to, to bring indicators and predictors closer together in the future. And, and I have some ideas about that that I need to further uh, season with my colleagues at University of Oslo. Um, but that's a point well taken. What's, what's the future of predictors versus indicators? And when do you have to use one versus the other? And we would like to get that a lot more integrated. Jason. Yeah. The... Twenty years 
I won't try to repeat everything Jason said for the Zoom users, but the comment was dealing with the the functionality between indicators and, and validation rules and, and they they why do we have two different things? Why can't we use validation rule out outcomes in, in analytics? We have five minutes. Let me <laughs> um, one point I, I would make out before we move off that is that indicators work from uh, data that's already gone through the analytics engine and validation rules could be used to validate uh, form data in real time, new new data values that haven't gone through analytics yet. Um, new in 3.8, and I'm gonna try to pick up the pace. Uh, we have a null keyword, which returns no value. So it's great if you if you have an indicator expression, you want an empty cell to appear on a table instead of a zero or instead of some other value. You can say, if this is return null, and similarly, we have a remove zeros function, which is basically equivalent to if, if the thing you're computing is zero, then put in a null instead. But you, then you just have to say, if this is a complex expression, you just have to say it once instead of having to say it twice. Uh, other functions that have been there since 2.34. Um, again, read the documentation. There is some useful stuff in there. And then program indicators and program rules. They got a lot of stuff. Uh, it's in 2.38, a stage offset function was added, just to, to note. If you have a repeating stage, you can say, give me the last value, give me the second to last value, whatever. Uh, that's a new expression that's been put in. Predictors. So predictors take data, either aggregate data or event data, and they transform it, and they always write out aggregate data as a result. But it's it's a general purpose tool. If you can do something with an indicator, do. If you can't, you can sometimes create predicted values, uh, and then you can use those in analytics in turn. Uh, past period data, uh, indicators can now do some of this with period offset. Predictors can just still do other things that, that, uh, that indicators can't. Count the number of organization units where some logical expression indicators can do some of this with sub expression they still can't do other things where you have multiple data elements that you're that you're comparing um if you want to predict oh an arrow is missing if you want to predict uh from aggregate input data you can run predictors there's an arrow supposed to be here that will generate aggregate predicted data you still have to run this through analytics if you want to use it in uh, in uh, analytics outputs. I have two minutes left on the clock. We'll see what we can do. Uh, if you want to, oh, again, sorry, the some of the arrows dropped out of this slide. If you want to have both events and aggregate data, you actually have to build analytics tables because the predictors take their input from event data from the event analytics tables. And then they can combine that with the raw aggregate input data. And then if you want to see it in analytics, of course, you have to build the analytics uh, data. Uh, that's it. Uh, ask questions on this. Come come find me at a coffee break or any time. We'll be in an expert's lounge, I think, tomorrow, as Scott said. Scott and I will. Uh, and if I've, if I've talked at too technical a level and you're wondering something higher up, don't worry. Ask me the higher up thing. I might be able to answer that, too. And uh, Report problems and request features on Jira. That's it. Thank you.